Hello, everybody. My name is Eli Hollingsworth, and welcome back to Against the Current, a The Chosen podcast, the biggest podcast about The Chosen TV series. And today, I am joined by none other than Demetrius Troy, a.k.a. the actor of Lazarus. Hey, hello, Eli. Thank you for having me. Hello, everybody out there. Uh, Demetrius is a thespian actor. He's a theater actor. He's a Foley artist. He does so many, so many things. He's very busy. He obviously, as we all know, does great work in The Chosen, but... Today it is, is all about Demetrius, which is, Demetrius is such a powerful name, you know, it's like, it's so big, I, have to, I can like take a bathroom break and come back before I finish saying it. So, well, for, I, I would like to say, did, does that come from somewhere, like Demetrius as a name? Like, is that, is there any special meaning behind that? Yeah, I mean, well, um, Demetrius, I'm named after St. Demetrius, um, everybody, oh, okay. you know, in, in, at least in the Orthodox faith, I'm sure it's in um, uh, other faiths as well. Uh, were named after a uh, patron saint. And okay. uh, when my mother and father were, you know, thinking of names, uh, they actually had come across uh, an icon of St. Demetrius that they didn't know that they had. And that's when they decided to name me uh, Demetrius. Uh, uh, okay. I have, a similar, I, I have a similar story about, you know, both my my children. We kind of allowed God to, you know, speak. You know, we pray about it, and then sometimes saints just start popping up. Uh, for my daughter, it was Irini Cristovalando, uh, is the saint that uh, is her patriot saint. And then for my son, it's uh, Maximus the Confessor. And I was doing a show out in uh, Syracuse, uh, New York, and I was driving an hour and a half to the closest Orthodox church I could go to, which was St. Maximus the Confessor. And then when I was uh, uh, when I was canting at my church, um, one of the uh, one of the um, guys that used to go to the church, he's an um, amazing iconographer. And he was leaving to go live in Florida with his father, who was a pro- prolific writer in the Orthodox Church. And he came up and he had this this, this piece of wood. Ra- I don't know if it was wood. It was something wrapped in a towel. He handed it to me when I was at the chanter stand. And he said, hey, this is for you. We, we've got to go. I don't know to say. You know, I, I said thank you later. I'm holding this as we're finishing you know, the end of the liturgy. And, uh, and I go up to my wife and I like, and she's pregnant with our son and I unwrap it. He's, he, Paul gave this to us and it was an icon of, of St. Maximus. Oh, wow. Actually hanging. Yeah. So that was it. It was just like, okay, he's, he's wow. that's, that's his paper. That's meant that's to be. Okay. <clears throat> well, that's awesome. And you being the history buff, you know, like Demetrius sounds like you're about to conquer a small, uh, country anyway, but, um, also, well, my poem. This is Demetrius Eleftherios Troy. Wow. Oh, so it's even longer. That's good. Yeah. Okay. Eleftherios is my father's name. Um, oh, that's... And, uh, yeah, we all have three... I mean, in our in our family, we have three names. My brother is Nicholas Dionysius Troy. My son is Maximus Demetrius Troy. Uh, he upgraded. We need Anna Troy. So we all we all have these epic kind of gladiator kind that of is, names. That is that is like it's like a brand right there. Like that is such that's such a powerful. Th- What's your mom's name? Um, my my mother um, was um, my mother's Spanish. She's from Colombia. Wow. And her name was Amparo, and she was Roman Catholic. And then she ended up uh, convert. Uh, she ended up converting to uh, Orthodoxy, and then her baptismal name is uh, Vespina. Uh, which is after the Theotokos, the the mother of God. My parents don't have middle names. Oh, it's us. Oh, okay. And it's a minimum three syllables for everyone. Also, I do want to establish for, for this interview, I want to establish a ground rule. Since we're dealing with someone who's involved with The Chosen, uh, Demetrius, any time I give you a compliment, you are not allowed to argue with me, okay? Just nod your head, say thank you, accept it, <laughs> okay? There's no modesty here. You don't have to be modest. We we all know you're great, so that's, that, is the, that is the rule. Don't. Just just let me compliment you, okay? Um go with your heart. I'm <laughs> uh, the, you're a theater actor. You're a voice actor. I just um, say, you know. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I'm an actor. I'm a director of all the artists. You have to be a jack of all trades in the business, mm. um, and it's also it's also good for you, uh, yeah, in accentuating your art. Many disciplines. I, I've trained. I trained as a stage manager. I trained as a lighting designer. Wow. Uh, I I I worked in a costume shop for five years. I've done a lot of. Yes, yes, I can hem my wife's dress. <laughs> uh, do I know? <laughs> yeah, and, and and if you're passionate about it, like if you're a true artist and you're passionate about your craft, 
then you naturally will be a jack of all trades, right? Or at least in some fashion, like you don't, you won't just do one thing, right? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's, um, yeah, yeah, you do have to be passionate about it. I mean, you have to love it. Yeah. You know, loving mm-hmm. what you're doing and either, you know, you have no choice and there's nothing wrong with that. You got to put bread on the table. Like you'd be your friends who are working at Publix and, wow. and yeah, the, those things are very important. What yeah. are your priority? You know, I, I've just been, I've been blessed to be able to be in the arts, uh, as, as a Christian and, yeah, yeah. um, also help, you know, support my family and then also kind of, you know, have the blessing of being part of projects that have touched so many people, which has been a, a really amazing Yeah, and uh, the space affirming and, uh, been a blessing. It's, it's a, yeah, it really is a blessing. Everybody here at the Chosen Fandom, we're all like, oh, Demetrius is awesome. If you ask anyone, any of the Chosen fans, they'll say, Demetrius is a great guy. We love him. He's awesome. But then if you would say, why? I don't know how many people. So let's let's unpack Demetrius today. Let's start with, so you're an artist. You're passionate about that craft. But uh, I want to start with how, where did that come from? From young Demetrius at an early age. Your story has, to, I hear it's something to do with the Wizard of Oz, right? Something to do with a lion. You know, it's funny. Um, th- there was always a sense of play in my family. You know, both my, both my parents came from very uh, uh, abusive families. They they had a, you know really difficult childhoods, uh, wow. and they never visited those things. And my brother, and I. they 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 were our friends. You know, they they oh, yeah. Uh, it, that's the best thing you could say is that I was more friends with my my parents than anything else but we still you know held that hierarchy of you know, respect uh, for our parents but we had fun we had so much we had the fun that they didn't you know they didn't have especially my father when they were when they were young and so my parents both were had a you know work long course with my dad dad worked with 40 different jobs in my lifetime uh in his lifetime and so they, I remember early on, they had, my dad had a restaurant that they ended up getting, I, I, I would be working there, I'm not making the shakes and cleaning the tables. And then he had a partner who was taking out the proceeds and going to the Arlington racetrack. So he got out of that business, um, he got, to, you know, did all them, lose the house and he had to support a family yeah. and he went into business with my mother and they ran an export import documentation business. Uh, with the house, oh, wow. and so my parents worked in the basement, and my brother and I had full reign of the house. <laughs> and had, you know, so I had my figures, I had my Marvel figures, we had uh, Star Wars figures, and every single little thing in a, a world. And my father at the dinner table, um, part of the business of uh, the export import documentation business was that he was a he ran a courier service, so he would go down to the consulates every day like driving 30 minutes down to chicago three times a day to drop off documents at different consulates and sometimes especially early on before i went to school i would go with them and so i got exposed to you know different dialects different countries yeah, different yeah. personalities and when we were at the dinner table my dad would throw in some dialects on the table we would speak in dialect at the table drive my mother crazy <laughs> we just had a blast um I know, but my mother, my mother was into theater when she was in college. Uh, she got trained by Vincent Price, um, oh, but wow. her main love was oil painting. Um, her house is just filled with her oil paintings. Um, wow, but that's awesome. she never really, she never really pursued it because you know it wasn't something that was making me to raise you know two boys and um, things are tough. Um, so, I think. It was in early elementary school where I, for some reason, just started auditioning for the like school plays. And when it, and then it, I got, I started getting really into it. it. Was seventh grade. Um, I wanted to be the line in the Wizard of Oz, and I got called to the music wing. And everybody was like, I got up from the, I got up from my desk, and everybody was like, Oh, <laughs> I know what's going on. So I go over there, and I find out that, uh, and I won't, I won't say her name. The student who was playing the lion, uh, she told me, "Sick, she's, she's definitely afraid." And 
has backed out of playing the lion. And I'm and I'm all just standing there cereals, but I'm jumping around outside. <laughs> yes. Uh, and yes. She's like, Would you play the lion? <laughs> and I was like little Robert De Niro, I'm like mm, I think I could yeah. find the time. Yeah. 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 yeah, right. And so <laughs> I ran down the hallway slamming all the lockers and then I got the tension I got uh, but I ended up playing the one. And I'll never forget playing the role. My mom made me a costume that the kids could pull the tail. Or, uh, and I was doing it like, um, what's the actor's name from the original? You know, I was doing the, you know, what's his name? Oh. Uh, um, man, I totally forgot. Oh, I forgot. I forgot yeah. about it. I know. Everybody, everybody who's watching this is going, oh, it's him, it's him. Yeah. <laughs> so I remember in Google Home, the gal who was supposed to play it was sitting in the front row and she was just her shoulders down. Uh, I mean, and I'll never forget that. Uh, I, I, I felt bad for her, but you know, it was great. It was, I mean, it was a great yeah. show. It was elementary school. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, along with that, I was training, I, I was playing baseball. I was really into baseball. I thought that's mm -hmm. what I was going to do. With hold on, hold on, hold on. Wait, a so you were a yeah. theater kid and a sports kid. That doesn't seem to be compatible. That it, it got to the point where it wasn't. Okay. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yeah. So when we got into high school, um, so I was playing uh, out there in high school. And then in my sophomore year, it was time for varsity. And it was either play center field, play Nathan Detroit and Guys and Dolls. I chose to play Nathan Detroit and Guys and Dolls. And, right but I was still on the traveling team. Uh, mm -hmm. Wow. So the guys, I was shunned by the baseball team. They were, uh -huh. they were not happy. And um, they came to see the show. And afterwards, after the show, they all came up to me and they were like, good job, man. <laughs> good job, man. And then it was funny. I became um, a, junior, a junior and senior leader in high school. And so you become, you go to classes and you're sort of like a motivational person for like, you know, weight class or I, I, I taught Tai Bo, which is really just popping in the video and making sure everybody's doing it. <laughs> uh, and uh, the coaches, because I've been, I've been doing all the plays, the coaches wanted the football players and the sports teams to have the kind of confidence that an actor does on stage. Uh. And so... I would hold improv classes in the gym before wow. we started training. Wow. And so it was me and other football players having to Im having to improv with me. Nobody's heard that story. <laughs> None of the people well, out loud. Oh. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the culmination of all that, I ended up going to college, grad school. And, um, I just, it just, I just stuck with it. And I, you know, had a really strong passion for it. And, um, People were just, you know, continuing to cast me and, and use me. And uh, now, now I'm, I'm here it's on the short end, unless you want to get specific. No, Demetrius, I do. I very much do. Um, so interviews, of, or let's close the book on Demetrius, Troy. <laughs> we got it. We, he's, he's done. Uh, got it. Got it. Friends it. Friends it. <laughs> so, you know, what's funny, though, is um, you're Demetrius Troy, and you sound pretty much exactly like Troy Bolton from High School Musical, the kid who wanted to play football or uh, basketball and be a theater kid. He had to choose. That's the story, the plot of High School Musical. So, oh, it, really? Yeah. So, um, it's, uh, I, I don't uh, the, now High School Musical, it's a Disney Channel original movie. It's made for more yeah. tween girls. So, the fact that I've seen it is like, don't ask why, but like, that was my first question in this interview. Um, we'll, we'll do an interview while I interview you. No, Demetrius, I'll be asking the questions here. Thank you very much. Uh, so, yeah, that's the so yes, he, he chooses. Yeah, I think he ended the, the, the end. It's because his dad wants him to go to college, be a football or a basketball star, and he wants to sing in the theater or whatever. So he ends up ch choosing to do what he wants to do. Uh, so basically, you are Troy, Troy, the same Troy. The Troys merge, and they're the same. So 2006, right? Is that what? What is an acting intern? by the way, I want to ask, because I think you were one. You're referring to, uh, so acting intern, I went to uh, University of South Carolina, the okay. Road Theater, uh, for my grad work. I went right from undergrad to grad work. Uh, it's a whole other discussion of, 
If Kush <laughs> Uh It was great training. Um, it was uh, it was tough. But our third year, um, you can either choose to stay at the university and teach, or you could apply for an internship at so many theaters around the, the nation. And one of the best was Milwaukee Repertory Theater. Uh-huh. And at the time, Milwaukee Rep had oh. a, a company, an acting company. And these are these are men and women who have been training together for, for years. And I happen to be at the golden age of that group um, as an intern. So when I went there, my job was to write my thesis and understudy anybody um, they wanted, wanted us to. Um, so we were in all the shows and covering all the roles. And I remember going in there, a um, great guy who, uh, he's, um, Brent Hazelton, he's a director up in uh, Milwaukee. He asked me, you know, me, young buck, he goes, it's like, how many plates can you spin? And I said, I'll spin as many plates as you want. I covered every single lead for the whole year. Wow. And, and it, and that was, that was intense. And was a lot. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Oh yeah. I have so many plays in my brain. I can't, I can't remember, but I'm sure <laughs> it's like filed somewhere. We could get in there. Uh, <laughs> Shakespeare, every it's all in tune. Yeah, to yeah. And so off of that, I went to um, Riverside Shakespeare, and then Chicago Shakespeare picked me up early in my career. And I've been doing a lot of shows from that. I'm Goodman, Timeline Theater, Stepping Wolf. Uh, so I was mainly doing theater early on because the scene in the, the television scene wasn't really prevalent in Chicago yet. And then as that started popping up, I slowly started, you know little roles here and there and um that's also when i met um dallas um before all the chosen stuff i was doing stuff for his um church ah but you know i played souls adam and adam eve and so jonathan's been my show jesus for a long time (laughs) but i kind of went beyond the intern stuff but that's the basic thing that i said before about um interning it it was just purely acting that's it okay solid We'll wow. break. We know you're a hard worker, though. That meant, that makes sense. I mean, I feel like. Do you ever like like um? You ever get confused sometimes? Like the characters are in your head, and like sometimes you're like, "Am I William Shakespeare?" Do you ever get? Do they ever float around in there? And I mean, I don't, I, I assume you're talking about method acting. Uh, you know, there there's a time and place for all those kinds of things, but <laughs> dangerous. It it, it can mm-hmm. be dangerous. If you yeah. don't have a good grounding. If you don't have a zero point. For me, it's faith, right? For me, it's family, which is a great, you know, your point. Yeah. Oh yeah. So it's like you go to some very dark. You can, it, you go to some very dark places, you know, in order to bring this this character to life, right? But you're walking a fine, you're walking a balance beam. You know, you have to be. You do have to be careful. Yeah, because you said yourself, you have said you like to play characters. Well, first of all, you say you like to play characters where the the script doesn't give you all the answers right which is why you said you're drawn to uh what was a checkoff um mm-hmm. you said you liked his characters a lot because he doesn't give you all the answers in the script yeah i, I mean checkoff's one of my you know one of my favorites i mean every play is you know i want to be a nerd i compared to jurassic art like you have a play as a piece of you know a, a dna structure and uh-huh. a missing point yeah so, yeah so you know no so. yeah definitely i i understood i understood that reference very much so I knew you. Were, I knew. Yeah, yeah, that's close. <laughs> uh, yeah, and and you say you like, uh, or for one character you were playing, you said he had. There's a fine line between the the goodness of character and, and the the evil. And um, some some characters you play go to some dark places. But I mean, first of all, method actors are weird. You know. Well, I, I mean, you know, I, I respect them. You know, they. I mean, there are times where, you know, I've done stuff where I won't. Well, I won't break character for the whole play or I've been in plays where I never leave stage. And so you stay in, you stay in that character, right. but you know, you have to have some sort of, um, like I said before, some sort of grounding, some sort of way to ease yourself out of it. Um, amazing actor, uh, Mike Nussbaum, um, uh, you look them up. He's been in so many different films. He's a, he's the oldest living equity actor. Wow. And I remember he was doing a play years ago where he was, he was playing, uh, and, a man who was going through Alzheimer's and dementia. And 
you know, as an older gentleman, uh, yeah. like I remember he didn't stay for the talk bag. And I remember he said to me uh, a while later when I did a play with him that he just, he needed to go for a walk. He did the play, mm. you know, he yeah. needed to clear his head. So it's like, if you have those kind of, whether it's a ritual or whether it's, um, the grounding in faith, whatever it is that can, that can, you can push all those things aside. Um, cause that's not reality. You know? mm -hmm. That's yeah. for the stay at. Leave it, yeah, right. leave it on the stage. Then uh -huh. bring it with you. Yeah. That's, that's no, that's, that's good. Yeah. That's a, that's a tough line to walk for actors, right? Because, cause you are creating art, like you're entertaining people, but also sometimes the stories can be like, they're really impactful. Um, so kind of similar to the, I mean, the chosen is a different thing, but like chosen is its own entity, right? Almost like the Dallas, Amanda, they talked about, they created this thing, but like they're kind of just holding the reins currently. Like it's kind of almost out of their control now. Uh, so art can be extremely powerful. I'm sure you know, um, as you lose that, but uh, it is also like, yeah, it's not real. Like it's, it's, it's entertainment ultimately. So, uh, but like on that same concept the you like, you are drawn, you say you're more drawn to roles where, you know, the, not all the answers are given, right? And some blanks are left to be filled in for yourself, right? How do you, how do you think that, applies to art and movies and cinema in general do you think that that's like i think movies are more impactful when you don't have all the answers like christopher nolan any christopher nolan movie really like do you think that that's that's a pivotal piece of uh well absolutely if, you know as opposed to i'm not gonna i'm not gonna name films or anything like that for any kind of controversy but you know when you are given all the answers you're stopping your audience from thinking yeah. your audience may not know this but they want to think they want to bring themselves to it because their imagination, oh, your your imagination is far greater than whatever I can put in front of you. To get all nerdy, it's like learning Boba Fett's, you know, backstory. Uh, yeah, exactly. Backstory. It, to me, it ruins the, the mystery yeah. of those characters. You know, if, <laughs> if you're any nerd and read the expanded universe, it's much better than what they, you know, yeah, have uh, out. Oh, yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, I think the highest form of art is when you have people walking out of the play or walking out of the movie, having a discussion and actually talking about the themes, you know, when you don't see, you don't see the brush strokes, you know, you don't see the creator in it, you know, yeah. you see yourself in it. and yeah, and you're able to really, to me, that's, that's you're, I think you're really creating art. Yeah. If you're, if you're taking an ideology and beating somebody over the head, giving him every single little uh, minutia. I mean, even, even you know, stuff that I've worked on, uh, like Re Re Relevant Radio, the things I'm directing, I'll I'll cut redundant lines. You know, it's like, or when a playwright puts in there, um, 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 you know, Johnny cries and then delivers the speech. No, 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 I see. <laughs> all my actors, uh, all that, all those <laughs> parentheticals, put them out. Right. Okay? Yeah. I want you to bring yourself to it. Yeah, no, I think that's why Christian media often gets criticized, right? Because they're betraying... The, the the rule of thumb in cinema, right? I would say is is kind of an unspoken rule, but like show don't tell, right? So if you have a message you want to portray or a theme you want to uh, have on screen, show it through your characters learning lessons and progressing through the story instead of having them tell it to the audience's face, right? I, I just to speak on that, I had an instance. Uh, one of the first things I started doing when I was in Chicago, early on in my career, was I worked with um, I worked with veterans, um, American veterans, and um, one of the the company was called Veteran Art Project, and we would take um, stories and artwork that veterans had created and make them into, you know, a, a presentation, a theatrical presentation. And I worked with this Vietnam veteran, and the he, he was living in South Carolina. Um, uh, the fantastic. He's become a really he's a, still a dear friend of mine, and uh, he. We, the only communication we had was we were talking on the phone. I didn't know what it looked like or anything like that. I just had his experience in my head from what he told me. And to me, he was everybody, all the pictures I've seen of war, of the Vietnam War, all those spaces of our, our, our young men. You know, I was just, I was at the Vietnam Memorial in DC um, yesterday. Wow. Yesterday. <laughs> and, uh, use all those names and so i was supposed to be writing a full-length play for this project and that's what i was focused on and then they started 
we started to find out that it was a showcase. It started becoming a showcase because they had so many artists working with uh, veterans and oh, they wanted wow. to present as much as possible. Yeah. So I ended up having cut it down to 15 minutes. Wow. And I didn't have time to get an actor. So I played him. <laughs> um, I played John. I, um, and I, and I broke his thing down into three monologues and he had an experience where he was overseas. He was a forward observer and his unit was being, uh, annihilated in the next Valley. And he was calling in artillery mm. and he was with a new Lieutenant. They, you know, got under fire and unfortunately he lost his life. And so he was there for three days. So I depicted those three days, um, in 15 minutes. Yeah. Now I had never met him in person. Ah. And he came to the performance. And from what my parents told me, he sat in the front row. And I got to play it, play him in, in front of the man. And I had to convince him because details are so important. The smells, the, the colors, details are so important. So there's yeah. that fear that the experience would be lost. And I, I convinced him that allow my acting and my portrayal to fill in the rest and it worked and i remember they had the artists and the actors stand up afterwards to greet each other and it was the first time we met and i remember locking eyes with him across the crowd and it was like nobody else existed and i felt i felt like i was meeting my brother um it was one i think that was that had to be my one of the greatest experiences i've had as an actor in this business to connect with with him and create that his eyes spoke at all the dawn is the eyes. nobody else mattered the highest form of art it, it like connects people beyond it transcends you know any words that can be spoken yeah I, you have to be you have to be well you have to be courageous but there's actors who you know they're afraid especially when they're trained they're afraid to go places go to places that they need to go to to portray these characters and they feel that they're gonna uh, they're gonna lose something themselves by sharing because you know sharing is it's a difficult thing for people um, yeah you know, no definitely vulnerable mm -hmm. and the thing is is that if you give yourself over it's more interesting yeah and because it be, it be, the character becomes more of an enigma and it relates and, and people are able to relate to that character even more all right i'm gonna you gotta be weary of me i'll monologue <laughs> yeah no that's that's awesome that's 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 why we're here is to talk so you've done like tons of theater you played a lot of a lot of characters so um uh, but you've also been in, in, a, in a number of you've been a good bit of film television right so what skills because theater is a whole other animal than film i feel like because it's live you're in front of an audience you don't get any retakes right so what 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 skills do you think from theater helped in film in any way like when you're filming the chosen or what what skill set from theater was really helpful for film for me is it's um you know my i mean the theater training you know no, I, I was trained to you know really create a fully realized human being and you get to do that on stage a stage stage work is a full body experience and you have that other partner and uh, not only in the person that you're you're speaking to, but the audience as well. Especially when you're working on something like Shakespeare, but even in contemporary plays, you still have that feeling of the audience. You still have to check in with them. You still have rhythms to play. For me, the difference between theater and film is that all of that full body experience is behind the eyes. Mm, that's yeah. It's, it's a razor focus because if you do too much on the camera. You know, it's like somebody who's, you know, talking like this, you know, <laughs> it, you distract the audience, mm. you know, and, you know, there's, you know, you know, little tricks here and there, you know, where you cheat, you, you, you're talking with somebody, but you're cheating your eye line to the outside. Yeah. So yeah. Your eyes are closer to the camera. Yeah. And, you know, there's these little, little tricks that you can do. Um, but for me, the, the, the preparation is the same. It's mm. just contained. Right. And it also depends on the shot. You know, is, is it a long shot? Is it a medium shot? Huh. Is it a, a close up, yeah. extreme close up? <laughs> Other, it's a different beast. It's a different beast. And mm. there are actors that struggle with it. I, I know, I, I can't say I struggled with it. It was just, it's definitely a learning curve, subtle learning curve, because as a theater actor, you want to move your body. Yeah, I know. You know. <laughs> 
names your hands a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, those, you know, how is it? You know, you don't want to saw the air. <laughs> there has to be a meaning to everything that you do. Right, yeah. Uh, but um, the thing with theater nowadays is, not with everybody, but I mean, I've seen a, a lack of, there's a vocal training that's lacking because everybody's, you know, into theater and film, uh, 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 TV and film. You get people that can't hit the back wall in a theater anymore. Uh, things become, uh, people try to get things more c- cinematic on stage. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if that's an audience demand or if it's the influence of, you know, TV and film actors on theater. Um, I, there's probably so many different um you know, reasons. But, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of factors. Low body to razor focus and behind the eyes. Yeah, it's all in the eyes and, and acting uh, and, and Phil. So, uh, and yeah, it's subtlety. It, 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 yeah. It's so much. Of, I mean, of course, you have to listen on stage. It's very important um, because there is an improvisational uh, quality. It's like you may have these lines, but I like to add moments in, in, in the plays where what if I don't say yes? What if I don't agree to do what the play wants to do? And in that moment, there's this electricity where the actor is choosing. And those uh, moments, we find moments like the bows. And that really translates uh, into the audience as well. Or people might think that you forgot what's opening. <laughs> How did you get tapped for The Chosen? You said you knew, you knew Dallas, you knew Jonathan from what, vertical, vertical show films, right? Is that what? You were part the of Harvest Metal, yeah, Vertigo Church Films. I okay. can't remember it's been so that, um, yeah. Oh, well, also, how many other characters did you audition for? Because I, th- I feel like every actor auditioned for like five roles before they got the one that they were casted, or did you? One. Oh, yeah, didn't... no, it was one, but it felt like a formality, uh, uh-huh. yeah, to be honest. And, um, because I, 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 um, lost touch with. It's funny, like Jonathan, Dallas, and myself, and I'm sure, you know, so many people, like, I, like, during that period where I lost touch with, with them, I went through a really rough period in my life and, um, you know, never lost faith in God. But, you know, there was just a lot of stuff that was going on that was very difficult that I'm not going to get into. And lost touch with them. And, and then when the, all the stuff with the lockdown craziness uh, started happening, uh, Dallas said, you know, I'd sent a Merry Christmas every while, but that was pretty much it. Um, uh, he had posted something on his page about the excitement of what art is going to be created in response to the times that we're living in. Yeah. And I had just been talking with my wife about this the night huh. before. And well, I wrote him and I said, uh, I, I, you know, talking about that. And then I just said, and I didn't even know the Chosen was happening. And uh, so I sent him a message and I just said, um, you know, I talked about that, and I remember he said, "You know, if you've got something going on, I'd really love to be a part of that. I'd love to get together and 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 create." So keep me in mind. And then he's like, "Well, funny you should ask because uh, season two casting is just dr- it was it was just dropping that day." And so he made me work for it. You know, I you know sought out um, an audition and and I found um, one that popped up for Simon Z. And um, so I you know. It, He's working with a casting director, you know, and he told me, he's like, I know you want, I know I want you in it. That's all I'm going to say. I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's totally fine. I respect that. But, you know, he has relationships with casting directors, you know, and so I went through the process of uh, getting in front of her and getting to know um, Beverly Holloway. And then it was like a couple weeks later and we were talking and I asked him, hey, what's, where, where are things going? And he goes, well... Um, I want you to play Lazarus. Cool. So the Lazarus or like Lazarus serving the drinks at the uh, winning Akina? Like, <laughs> you know, you know, the <laughs> waiter number three, his yeah. name is Lazarus. <laughs> um, and uh, no, so it ended up being uh, the Lazarus and, and that's it. Um, now, yeah, now we're we're in the throes of yeah uh, all of this. Now we've now we yeah. got to Chosen Con and Maybe, so, which was amazing. Yeah, that that was amazing. That was crazy. Uh, I'm sure it was crazy. For, like, just probably awesome for you to see the fruits of your labor, right? Like, you know, because like you, you can see people on the internet, and you can they say it's impacting them. They say how much it means to them. But then to have a face to face conversation with another human is a completely different experience uh, entirely. So, oh, absolutely. It's you know, as I I, I 
this keeps on popping up for me, you know, leading fans of the chosen, it was faith affirming. Yeah. You know, to know, you know, I was actually, when I was at, when I was at the cap inside the Capitol <laughs> uh, to, um, um, a, a lady there, um, and just for privacy, I won't say wh what her name is, but, uh, you know, we were talking about the impact of the chosen and, and I started thinking about the, you know, it's like with iconography in the early church, we have been stained glass windows and, 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 uh, in churches as well, those were, you know, meant for people, those visuals were meant for people who, you know, who were illiterate, you know, who, you know, and as, as, as symbols for them to follow. Right. And we're in, we're still in a, we're even heavily in a visual society. And there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of rep visual representation of things that are not exactly conforming to faith or yeah. belief. And, um, and, or, or has a strong presence like that. And now we do. Yeah. And so now we have those visuals like they had in, in the early church, um, uh, as, as examples. Um, so I see it that way. I see it as a, a blessing that the Lord's, you know, people may not agree with all the theology in it or where things are going, but, and, and, and there are times where I don't, but God's name is on people's lips. Mm, that's yeah. what's important. Right. People are discussing it. People are around mm -hmm. the world are connecting about it. Yeah. I, I did a cameo. Uh, I, I have a cameo channel um, that uh, 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 a friend of mine actually asked for a video. That was on TV. So I, I and I made it like at three o'clock in the morning before I had to go to the airport because I almost forgot because they, they were crazy. And he had mentioned how him and his godmother who. You know, kind of a little bit the nation. It's something that ignited their relationship, and they they watched the chosen or they rewatch episodes and they, they discussed them and it brought them even closer than they were before. And that's exciting that those things are happening. So it's like okay, it's great to get a pat on the back. <laughs> I'm doing a great job. That's that's what. But in the end, I'm able to bring my craft. And my faith together. Yeah. Wow. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, there's it's nothing better than that. I mean, of course, I'll do secular work as well. I mean, I'm doing Richard the Third at Chicago Shakespeare Company, mm. but to um, have that, yeah. yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's the highest thing. You know, if the chosen is art, that's what we were talking about. You know, it it shows and doesn't tell. That's why it, it separates it from other Christian media. So. Like to get in people, you said the best ones, the best uh, films or projects are when people walk out discussing it. And what The Chosen does, its sole purpose is to generate discussion, which is there's no better, no better thing to do. seeing themselves in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they see, oh, Jesus wasn't good at sports in this, you know, yeah. they relate to that. And maybe that's not, that's probably not true. Yeah. But it's getting them thinking about Christ. Yeah, you know, it's petting to think about themes that in the Bible. And yeah, yeah, it's scripture. You know, it's it's getting people to be like, wait, did that actually really happen? Oh, well, that didn't happen, but this happened. This is what happened. You know, and they're going yeah. on their little computers. You know, they're finding out, finding out yeah. more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so maybe that's what's uh, you know the you know the best thing about all of this. I, I've visited your house on set, which is it's awesome and it, like just i'm sure for you like first of all as a history buff which i know you are you're a huge fan of history isn't it awesome just to like be on set and see these things they've built like all the stuff they they've built yeah cri cribs of bethany you know yeah right there. <laughs> right, right there. um yeah it was it was um it was amazing uh to see it well and um crew of the set dressers with, with cinematographers that the world that they create for us mm. is just for an actor it's a gift uh, you know it's yeah you know <laughs> oh there's so much i can't tell you um as my brain was just bringing up some stuff <laughs> about these like ah i can't i gotta put those away <laughs> can't talk about um but yeah it's um yeah it's it's it really is amazing what they can do and mm -hmm. what they can do together I mean, I've been to um, the Capernaum in, uh, mm -hmm. in on set, and is every building is functional? Yeah, 
Oh, uh, it's like you're walking back in tonight. Yeah, yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, it's it's awesome. Uh, but Lazarus is so I I'm getting a sense. My my film senses are tingling. I'm getting a sense of Lazarus having an interesting arc this season, interesting character uh thing. So he's pretty rich. he's pretty well off and in the show when we see him in season four. Um mm-hmm. That's the Dallas has, Dallas has said this before. He's mentioned that this is going to be a part of season four. Pretty sure, um, and I've seen I've seeing his house on set. It's pretty big, um, so he's pretty well off because this is your season, really. Season four is your season. I cannot confirm. We're denying the potential <laughs> filming, filming okay. uh, uh, scene or scenes that you may be suggesting. Or right, I will tell you that the, the oil business that Zebedee and the gals are starting is really going to skyrocket. I've got I've got appetizers, billboards. I've got what we're going to do. The ministry is going to fly. You're doing commercials and I got the apostles with billboards, you know, spinning. Winners, yeah. uh, <laughs> slum, come the get the oil. Here. <laughs> oh, but no, I think this is this really is your season, so that's exciting for you as an actor, I bet too. To have a character who's ripe for the picking, right? We haven't seen a whole lot of Lazarus, but I'm sure you've created this whole canon in your head. Being a theater actor, you have to create this whole character. So I'm sure. You, are, are there things that you've created in your head canon that? haven't exactly been on the script. Is there anything that you've thought of, oh, this would be a cool scenario if this happened, like being the Trigon star? Is there any little bits bits that you have in your head canon that- I'd like to say old Judean Trigon champion. Right, okay, okay. Yeah, I mean, with, with any kind of character, there's definitely questions that pop up. You know, eventually, I mean, it's no secret, eventually, you know, we're going to get those biblical things, whether it's in season four or season five. Mm. Um, you know, that doesn't really matter. We can discuss how do you play somebody who is who has died and resurrected? Yeah, and there's questions that up for me as an actor is, but did he see? Yeah, did he see? Some? Yeah, you know, how does that affect him? How does that affect his humor? What changes in him? How does he see? Does he begin to see? I, you know, I've lived I've lived in a monastery. Um, I I'm close with a lot of monks and priests and and a lot of aesthetics. And there is something behind the eyes that they they see the the negative of the world. They they, they are on the mm-hmm. on the forefront of the spiritual the spiritual uh, warfare. Yeah. yeah, I remember I had a discussion with an abbot. He wanted to know me. It was one of my first couple of days uh, being at the monastery. And he's like, Demetrius, tell me about your tell me your prop. What are your problems? And so I start talking about my problems, and as I'm talking, I'm realizing I'm I'm speaking to this man who's on the the front lines of the spiritual warfare, and I'm like, it's all fleeting, yeah, you know. Yeah, it, yeah. W- what I was talking about meant nothing, you know. And here's a man that's focused on so the, the, his his salvation, the salvation of you know the world. And I think it's a stronger choice for an actor to make that he he probably does see the other side. In an Orthodox tradition, you know, when we think of Saint John the Forerunner, Saint John the Forerunner wasn't just the forerunner of Christ on Earth, but he was the forerunner of Christ in Hades preaching the coming of, of our Lord there to who to who would listen yeah. and not everybody listened. And so I like to imagine that he did see that and that greatly affected him. Whether or not, you know, when whenever we film it, <laughs> that comes across, I you know, I hope it does in in the betrayal. You well know, in that in that in that journey. Yeah. Yeah. I may or may not have taken or going to take. <laughs> When I bring that up, people are just like, it's like people are, don't know what to say. I mean, I guess it's controversial. It's like, but like I said, as an acting choice, it, I think it's a stronger choice that did see. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it comes to a realization that nobody around him has, you know, he yeah. is his realization of, I would think in that moment, his realization of who Jesus is becomes on par with Mother Mary, and that in that respect he understands more than the apostles in that moment. Yeah, I mean we're speculating. Let's you know keep our speculation to you know to the chosen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way we're not getting into a the- theological debate, and you know you know things are open to interpretation uh, from people. You know, for me in season three, it. Um, I believe he had, I, I played with that. He, he was willing to accept the possibility. I wasn't sure. But what he did know, and I think, you know, Lazarus is, you know, a salt of the earth kind of guy. 
a loyal a loyal dog. What he did know was that his this is his friend, mm-hmm. you know, and more than his friend, you know, this is kind of a, a blood brother. So I think that he was open to the possibility that this would be this could be true. Uh, I, I based it off his friendship and his love for him. I, I'm I'm going to make this leap. And in yeah. that moment when he comes up, you know, when um, he uh, stays true to that part of scripture, even gives his, he he's willing in that moment to sacrifice in the show, sacrifice his life for his friend, to defend his friend. Then we see him in the Christmas special, and he's a much different person. So, which that is interesting that you you played, you played him later first. I believe I believe the Chris that's Christmas special is fifteen years after the resurrection. At least that's what they told me. But then I saw forty eight BC. I think I saw forty eight or forty nine BC. Probably edited in DC yesterday. No, no, I think it was it was it was forty something. I feel like actually you're right. I feel like it was in the in the edit. It was it was definitely a certain amount of time after some sometime after. How much of Lazarus had you figured out for your interpretation of the character at that time? I had to think about all the. I had to think about all those things I just talked. About. You know, it's like there's the question of who's the man right after, then there's who's the man after years of right. contemplation, and then you think, and then the other thing that you think is like he's given another chance at salvation. He saw what he saw. If, if as an actor, I'm going with that interpretation. I saw what I saw. And I see how people, you know, how people are living their lives after I get resurrected. And I'm given a chance to walk the path again. What a gift. Yeah. What a gift. You know, there's traditions where they say, you know, we didn't smile for the next 30 years except for <laughs> once. Uh, there's uh, a other option from that. Some people would interpret that as like, how could he not smile or anything like that? And Dallas didn't want me to go that route, which I, I agree with because knowing the monks that I know, usually they don't. They try to steer away from laughter, but uh, hilarious. It could be so hilarious, oh, and yeah. so you know, I've experienced monks laughing, and it's just so, it's heartfelt, you know. But you know, they yeah. try to be super, but they're humans. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. like the Magic Lazards, you know, still having a sense of humor. Yeah, maybe yeah. sober, maybe more sober <laughs> than he was before. <laughs> All those things need to be thought about. And whether or not you can play them or not, and I'll tell this to act, this is why backstory is really good. Research is really good. You may not be able to play it on stage in the line, but because you did that research, yeah. that lives in your body. And it's present. You just have yeah. to trust it. It, it. I guess it could be a beauty and a curse when you're creating art, is that you're never going to have the same hymn. Mm-hmm. You're never going to have the same, yeah. you know, like uh, Death of a Sales. And yeah. it's, it's a different body. It's a different person. They're different. Right. Of yeah, it, which is exciting and also can be a curse. <laughs> mm. How much of yourself do you put into Lazarus? That you say the best stuff is when you're vulnerable, when you're sharing yourself, right? So then, how much of yourself are you sharing when you are putting into a character of Lazarus? I guess my humor, my cheekiness, my mischievous ties. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, you know, to me, he's probably at least, at least before, you know, before, you know, the, the major events. He's kind of like a, a puck character for me. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, fun, mischievous. You know, he's the was the captain of the Trigon team. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I you, know, was, you can't avoid it. It's where the truth lies. But there are little bits of you and everything being portrayed. Is there anything you can give us? Give us something juicy. What is like a little tease you can give us at all? I will share an experience from an interview I did in July. Okay. And, and y- y- you guys will see this. Uh, at some point, I don't know, uh, <laughs> that they did it up. Um, but I, and I hate this question, describe season four in one word. In one word, okay, yeah. That's... Like, what? <laughs> I just got done with a uh, middle of the night shoot that I didn't get back from. I, I started work at 6 p.m. and I didn't get back, no, 4.30 p.m. And I didn't get back to the hotel Till like 5 30 a.m and i was doing a scene wow. an intense scene um a one-on-one scene with somebody and um that day i had an interview and so sitting in the interview they asked me that question and i don't know why i thought about this but i said okay like i can't think of a word but i can give you an accurate I'm like oh okay what's that uh, they weren't asking what an actor. 
<laughs> I said Amos. And you were like Amos, and I said a man of sorrow. Ah, uh, there are more than one men of sorrow in mm. season four. That's that's sick. Did you come up with that on the spot? I did. Wow. Yeah, I, I couldn't believe it myself. <laughs> we go, ah, I did it. I, yeah. I did give myself a little pat on the back. <laughs> my You're like, that was cool. That is going to look good. And you, can, and you can interpret that men or women. Okay. Right. There are like, more than one, uh, there's more than one man or woman sorrow in, hmm. in season four. So it's, it could be, but a was doesn't sound as cool as I'm a, a mas, So, you know. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't I couldn't do the interview without you getting some yourself? no I couldn't help myself of course not I can't I'm, I gotta know everything what is the the first line of your episode season 4 I, I think I remember it being one of anger your first line was one of anger yeah okay okay uh, don't think about it too much I don't think about it too much <laughs> okay. uh, no it was, the, it was there okay um, no, nah, next week is going to be a video. Uh, Demetrius Troy's first line is, and we'll break it down. Yeah, and I'm going to get a call from Dallas. <laughs> Demetrius, what, what, what are you? Uh, what, what did you say? What are you saying? <laughs> that was that was a great impression. We got that out of the way, and we're done. You're safe now. We're in the safe zone. We're in the clear. Wanted to give you a little bit of trouble, but uh, not too much. You're talking uh, about a kid who can put himself out of anything. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, you, and you're very good at it. I jump through. You jump through. Good amount of hoops there. And you're is impressive. I applaud you as an opponent. Last thing I do want to talk about. So you're also a foley artist, right? Which is a whole different thing from which I've always been so fascinated by. It's a whole different thing from your acting career, being a foley artist. So explain to people what a foley artist is if they don't know, of course, and then just kind of talk about the bit about that. So uh, well, let me tell you how I got into it. I, I was actually doing it for uh, a children's show in South Carolina when I was in grad school. And we would go around um, and perform a through de the, the Department of Health and Education of this show about eating healthy. And you want to talk about poor? Like we have poor in this country, and I don't think anybody really realizes that. Yeah. And so anyway, I played this. Uh, I well, I changed the character to be a giant rabbit, and so <laughs> I made these like big rabbit feet and everything like that. And so I was the I was the narrator, and I had my two friends uh, who were in school were playing a, a mouse, two two mice, and the one mouse was eating too much and not staying healthy, and uh, the other mouse be healthy and eat the right things, and and then I was I would come out and narrate, but I would stay in the back and I would follow the script and I had a drum kit and I had all these sound effects things and I would create the sounds oh. as we were going on in the show. So I had that experience. Now I had been working for Unshackled for a number of years just as an actor. And right before the lockdowns, um, my director and really dear friend Tim Gregory came to me and asked me like, listen, I want to take you to lunch. Um, can we, can we talk? I'm like, okay, let's go. <laughs> and he sat me down and he offered me to be part of the company and uh, to be, um, I'm, I'm one of, um, I, I have two swing uh, uh, Foley artists as well that um, will take over if I'm not there. And I, you know, I have been not there for, well, I, I'm doing actually, I'm doing a three murder starting Saturday. That's out oh. to be pretty, Amazing. Wow. I'm playing a little beat in it. I'm not doing Foley work for it. Uh, so a Foley artist. A Foley artist will create the sounds for a film or a radio program. And sound is, is, is extremely important in especially film and radio because it yes. really paints the environment. Yeah. That for example, the world. Mom, yeah. For example, the, it, it really draws the audience into the environment you should have really good sound if you if you see ever see a movie that doesn't have good sound you'll know it right away yeah At all all of a sudden what what is supposed to be three-dimensional is now two-dimensional and right. at a distance but when you have that sound that surrounds you it brings you it pulls you into the piece just as good music pulls you into the piece right uh for example the indiana jones punch it's it's a baseball bat on wet leather. That's that's the sound of the Indiana Jones punch, the iconic sound. A breaking of the of a neck 
or a bone could be taking celery and cracking it. Uh, uh. So it's just enough to feel real, but also just over the top to make it so visceral to the audience that it actually is more real than it, you know, it would be. And so, you know, I'll, you know, for, uh, I'll either, uh, sometimes I'll look for digital sound on websites that are helpful that let's say if I can't create it on my own, uh, whether it's a, a specific engine for a car, you know, we need a, I need the engine of a Mustang or I need the sound of a, of a humvee idling in the desert. Sometimes I have to search for those things or I'll go outside with my recorder and I'll record different things. If I need a, huh. like my wife's driving, my wife's like, it's like, honey, you've got to WD-40 or Vaseline the doors. They're too creaky. I'm like, yeah, but it'll make a big sound. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, and they get better over time. I have to do it because I don't want to wait. I don't want my kids to wake up. So then uh, for Unshackled, we record the show in studio in the basement, uh, in our basement studio. And then we perform it for free at three o'clock on Saturdays for a live audience. Oh, wow. And so I'll be surrounded by, you know, doors or whatever I need for the show. And then as the show's going on, I'm not only voicing characters, but I'm doing the sound. So, you know, footsteps i've got you know two shoes i'm bringing together or if i'm doing multiple sounds at once i'll have my shoes on and i'm walking in the floor and there's a mic there and then i'm like you know stirring coffee as i'm walking <laughs> you know because you know it's yeah there's all these environmental things that i have to do and it you know it, it works it makes them into this kind of like old classic radio program oh yeah that's, that's uh, cool so i think yeah i think that's a good explanation well inside into what yeah. I am on the side. Yeah, no, I've always been fascinated by the Foley artists because sound is incredibly important. And it's just like... I've been, at, I've been at breakfast with my whole family and I said, shh, everybody shush, shush. <laughs> what, what, what? I got to record the American. <laughs> record all, all the yeah. this sound. Okay. Yeah. And then I'll leave that. Or I remember, uh, <laughs> this is terrible. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get flack for this. But my daughter was crying and <laughs> and I'm like, and, and I was about to pick her up, but instead of picking her up right away, I <laughs> like, are you serious? I'm like, it's just a couple seconds. I can move it. <laughs> that's, and that's a, that's a completely different skill set than acting as well, but also radio too. Cause even if you're doing voice, voice work for radio, that is a different, like voice acting is much different. That, like talk about okay, so we've got we've got through the layers of condensing your acting, right? Because theater is full body experience, film is it's all in the eyes, right? And then voice acting, you can't even see you; it's just your voice. You're having to to sound like you're in the emotion, right? So you're not. Well, it, it's and, and also directing it has um, has been very helpful. Like right now, I'm in the middle of directing say Valentine and um, mm -hmm. Rini. I, they had, um, I did have a rehearsal with Cabrini yesterday, and I had seen Valentine's rehearsal in D.C. the day before on Zoom. <laughs> so it's been crazy. And then I've got recordings next week. So, But as a director, you, you can get more in tune about how, how things need to sound. It, it's a mix between theater and film. There are moments that are very... The sound is very cinematic, but with a radio drama... You want to be able to use the language to um, to paint the environment. You, you, you know, yeah. say it, you, you, you've got a line that says, um, "Where did I put my book?" Simple as that. Let's say, or instead of, "Where did I put my Where did I put my book?" You could be like, "Where Where did I put that book?" You know. So you're, yeah. you're kind of indicating. I hate using the word indicating that you're you're searching for something. Yeah. No. Yeah. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Yeah pace going and the drive of the story going but it slows it down in a way that that the audience um can stay with you and uh because there are times where radio and audio dramas they'll edit the dialogue right on top of one another uh, uh and so you start losing and, and start not being able to follow arguments uh, it actually happened in one of my episodes of saint george last week that i'm trying to get changed um, just because the editing was too on top of each other that uh, even night director couldn't follow uh, 
couldn't follow the story because there was too much space between they, they eliminated space between lines. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Pacing is important. Yeah. Well. So I, I, I believe it's a mix of theater and uh, it's a cinematic quality, but it has a flavor of theater and that it has to, it, it has to be more picture. I mean, even words, it, the way you color words and use vowels to express emotion. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is yeah. with the actual, yeah, because uh, you uh, mind because you don't want to make it, um, you know, you don't want to make it a melodrama, right? Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, and, and, and Jonathan can testify to that too, because Jonathan started as a voice actor, right? So, because voice acting is, it's, I think it's, I don't I mean, and there's obviously pros and cons, but like, I think it's harder to do good voice acting because, like, especially nowadays, you know, first of all, how Chris Pratt is in every animated movie ever that's being released nowadays um and he just chris pratt is i like chris pratt as an actor but chris pratt is when he's voice acting he's just speaking like it's chris yeah, chris pratt. pratt exactly yeah that's the brand it's like you you yourself become a brand yeah yeah and like john lithgow is a brand great guy too oh, really? I, I, I narrated with him for the chicago symphony orchestra what an amazing man oh, really? uh, um and um but he has his own brand. He has his own cadence. There's a rhythm to what he does. Like mm -hmm. you're getting, even though he plays different roles beautifully, he's still John Lithgow. Yeah, it's the same thing. I'll, you know, actors like Alec Baldwin, or, mm -hmm. you know, John oh, yeah. Boyd, Bobby. You know, they they're that Robert De Niro. Yeah, yeah. And that's their. They are. They are their their most truthful selves, or something like Christopher Walken. Mm, yeah. Oh, that's true. Yeah. yeah. You know, they themselves become a brand. Oops. Yeah. So there's difference between like an actor and a voice actor. Would you say like because a voice actor like Mark Hamill for or Mark Hamill for instance, he did he played Luke Skywalker, right? He did the acting uh, for Luke Skywalker, but then he's also played the Joker. Like he's done. He's the only Joker that I know. Yeah. No. Uh, I think he's the greatest. Joker. Yeah, yeah. He's he's the the best of the best. Which. So sad that he's retired recently. Because Kevin uh, Ke Kevin Conroy, the Batman, died. The Batman from Batman the Animated Series. I know. Yeah. His quote was, um, "Without there, without Batman, crime has no punchline." So now he's done as the the Joker, which is sad, incredibly sad, because he was the best one. But uh, he and I guess I guess you you what you're saying is true applies for Mark Hamill as well, because he does different voices, like he did Joker and Chucky, but like it is still he is he is the brand. But I feel like like Mel Blanc back all the way back for Looney Tunes even, like those those people they that's like a voice actor to me. That's a character actor. True. Okay. Yes. Oh, yeah. So the voice voice acting, but there are different kinds of there's actors that are character actors. I can see right. myself a character. Yeah. You know, but okay. I also the leading man. But I I live I love playing character. My my you know my life is dialect. You know I've I've done so many different dialects for you know I mean, relevant radio as of recently. I've done tons of dialect. You know everybody every actor has a different skill set, and sometimes you know they can play in multiple roles. They can do multiple dialects. They can change their voice in a way like Mark Hamill can. And then there are I guess actors if I want to say they just have have a rant their voices become iconic and you're talking about producers who want to make money so it's just like hey everybody knows chris Pratt. let's get Pratt, chris Pratt in here right yeah and you want that voice you know that that kind of um prestige it, it sells so that you would say that kind of, that degrades the art in any way right if a producer is just trying to make money it, it, it's a business there are certain times where it's unfortunate because mm -hmm. as a chicago actor a lot of the leads go to new york and la Oh uh, yeah, 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 and and it, in the bottom, the bottom line, and it, it, it's frustrating. It, it, it's uh, it's frustrating for people who are starting out, who are trying to break into the business, who just want to break their glass ceiling mm -hmm. um, as an actor, right? And then you're not given a chance to play Hamlet or you know play King Lear because they got so and so from the television show, right? But in the end, there are no theaters that are not in the red. You know, there is the expenses that go into it. In the end, if you want to survive on the production side, you, it's a business. Yeah. As, as frustrating as that sounds, and it's frustrating for me, but you also have to understand it from 
you know, their perspective, you know, somebody, and there are times where somebody with 19,000 followers is going to get it over the person with 4,000 follow, uh, followers. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's that factor as well. And I moved out, you know, I'm, I'm very much a person that's about merit. That's about, you know, there's, there's loyalty, there's merit, there's, uh, you know, respecting somebody's skills, but in the end you have to, you're putting so much money and, and there's so much responsibility and there's so many different factors. If you can err on the side as, as best as you can towards success, you got to go that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, um. Yeah, there's uh, for these producers. Was, I mean, there's a lot at stake. Not to there's a lot at stake, but there's also a lot of uh, unfortunate um, um, advantages that some people take. That uh, which is why things like the SAG after strike happen. Yeah. Uh huh. You know, not to get into specifics, but people are human, and people make human choices, and unfortunately, it, it affects people that. Um, uh, it affects too many people in the negative yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like when I, I an actor, you know, the best thing I could tell an actor is preparing for an audition is worry about what you can control. You can control yeah. your preparation. You can control your skill set. You can control staying in contact with people and networking. Those things that you, those you know, those are little things that you control. The rest is at God's hands. Right. Yeah. Which is what it all goes back to, anyway. Is that that is that's the zero point that's the bottom line right for us as christians that's where our faith is is in god anyway so um demetrius you've gone from the lion in the wizard of oz to being on the show about the lion of judah it's come full circle uh for you so thank you so much for for giving so much of your time for this interview uh glad we got to talk and hopefully you know people learned learned something about you today that they didn't know, which I'm pretty sure happened, because uh, I did some research to make sure that. Uh, that no, Doug, I could tell you research. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was. It's, it's, see, that's what that's that's why I do what I do because my nerdy brain, like I gotta gotta learn everything. So, like, by the way, you're almost almost out of toilet paper. You should get some more. That's a great thing because it's a Costco run. They have samples. <laughs> <laughs> Family trip. Oh yeah, it's. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for stopping by. Um, you're you're a phenomenal actor. You do such a great job. You're such a hard worker. Thank you for for stopping by. I'm so glad that you're a part of the chosen. Glory to God. Yeah, it's it's amazing. Thank you for having me for this interview. And for thinking about me, uh, you know, thank everyone for the love support. You know, come to the Demetrius Troy fan page. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I'm in that. I'm in it. Out, you are. I put out I, uh, exclusive stuff once in a while and interact yeah. with the fans. And we have time over there. Um, you know, hit me up on Cameo. I'm doing videos for people that seem to be enjoying them. But it means to me, just to, I, 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 I you know, I say this a lot. It's just that I'm blessed to be part of this community, this mm. this God community, uh, and loving community. And not a day goes by that I just am in awe of the faith and and beauty all of you, all of you have. You know, thank God it's it's brought us all together, and God willing, it'll continue to grow and reach uh, people around the world and and bring us closer together, um, uh, on on and towards the path to salvation. All right, thank you, Trigon uh, Captain. Um, so all Judean Trigon tra champion. Ah, there you go. Yep, that's. Uh, uh huh. You should check out High School Musical, by the way. Be sure to subscribe to Against the Current and the Chosen podcast on YouTube if you haven't already. Uh, be sure to subscribe to my podcast if you're watching on YouTube. And follow Demetrius at uh, Demetrius.Troy on Instagram, right? And um, follow him out on his socials. He's pretty cool. He has some cool stuff. And uh, I'll see you guys in my next video or slash podcast episode. Mm -hmm.